Um, welcome everybody to our Come Follow Me discussion this week. I have Brother Raider with me today, a uh, good friend of mine. Uh, grew up in Tennessee. What part of Tennessee did you grow up? Awesome. So I grew up in the Murfreesboro, Smyrna area, right? So right in middle Tennessee, uh, just southeast of Nashville. That's where I grew up. So I'm a homegrown southeasterner, born and raised, and it was a great experience. And your wife's from Georgia, so you live in Georgia. Yeah, my wife's from Georgia. Yeah, that's, that's where we ended up living, and it's, it's been good to be back in the southeast. We've been back in the southeast for about five years now. So, Excellent. Glad to have you with us here. This scripture block that we're discussing this week is Mosiah 11 through 17. So everyone feel free to open up your scriptures to Mosiah chapter 11. And we're just going to talk a little bit about the historical context and some of the content that's in this. Uh, as we reviewed the last week is we have Zenith who takes a group of people out of the land of Zarahemla to go home, so to speak, to the land of Nephi. Well, now they're down there in the land of Nephi, surrounded by Lamanites, and they're there for a long time. Zenith eventually passes on, and his son Noah takes over. Uh, we were having a, a conversation. Brother Raider, tell me, what do you think led Noah into being so wicked? That's, 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 that's a great a great question, Darren. I I don't have a specific answer on, on that per se. You and I were talking a little bit about Zenith's overzealousness before that he was just so eager to do this thing and it was it was over the top almost right with his passion for the land of nephi and sometimes as parents we can be over the top and some of the things we're passionate about it and it has a negative effect on our kids right the, the thing that's interesting to me with this is that noah at the, at the end of chapter 10 as we're getting into chapter 11 right here right he's just seen this miraculous deliverance where his dad's old and he's armed his old men and his young men, right? They're surrounded by the Lamanites. They're hopelessly outnumbered. And yet his dad has faith. They go forth in the strength of the Lord, and the Lord delivers them in this, in this, in this mighty battle. And so Noah saw some miracles. He saw some powerful things. And yet when you get right into chapter 11, he just, he's idolatrous. He just doesn't care. He's just about himself. And so something's happened where there's a big disconnect between even though Zenith was overzealous and going to the land of Nephi might not have been the wisest thing. He loved the Lord, right? And, and, and he, he I, you see him as, as, I think, a good man who just got a little off track, but he gets back on track with his faith in, in, in the situation I, that they're in, you know, but Noah just, he doesn't, he just goes his own way. Yeah, it's interesting because he does see some of those inner battles amongst the Nephites trying to get the land and then yeah. the years of peace and then the battle. But notice verse 2. This is chapter 11, verse 2. He causes his people to commit sin. So it's interesting. Can somebody really make you to commit sin? Uh, maybe not make you, but boy, they can sure lead you in the wrong direction, which is what King Noah does. Yeah, you know, and, and, and I think sometimes the influence of others can cause us to rationalize things that we know to be wrong. We're like, <laughs> my king's doing it. I'm just following his example. I don't have to take responsibility. You know, he's living it up and having fun. So, why, you know, I'm going to as well. Yeah. You know? And so I, I think that those around us can definitely influence us to rationalize our decisions. And I think verse 3 is almost humorous that because of his wickedness, they put this burdensome tax of 20%, which we know later it gets raised to 50% by the Lamanites. But I think it's humorous. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to only have a 20% tax bracket uh, on everything? Uh, but verse 4, notice what they use the money for. Noah, everything is about him supporting his lifestyle and his wicked priests. Whereas his contemporary up north, King Benjamin, everything is about, I want to be self-reliant and self-supporting so I can serve the people and not be a burden on them. There's really two complete contrasting uh, viewpoints right there. Well, yeah, and, and, go ahead. Sorry, Darren, just with, with, with those priests too, Noah wants to surround himself with people who will not criticize him. He doesn't take well to criticism. He doesn't want to hear that he has to change. And I think that part of that, part of the reason he does that is because deep down inside, he knows he's wrong. He does. And so he's just, you just see him building this wall to keep out all prickings of the spirit right here. Yeah. And, and I think that's why he rages against Abinadi later on. Great comment. Speaking of Abinadi, let's just jump there now because the Lord is going to send a prophet to correct this 
uh, apostate, wayward group. Uh, verse 20, Abinadi shows up on the scene. Tell us what you think about Abinadi and his teachings and why is this so impactful for us today? I love Abinadi. You know, Elder Holland recently recently spoke to us about Abinadi about a year ago um, in, in, a, in a training, right? And he's one of Elder Holland's heroes. And as I went back through this with these Come Follow Me chapters, I was really trying to look at it through Elder Holland's eyes. You know, we have very little information about Abinadi. He just shows up. You know, he where does he come from? What's, what's fascinating to, to, to me about this is that as wicked as the people are, is that the Lord will speak to anyone who's willing to listen. And he calls a prophet from among these people, right, who have kind of descended into, into this lavish and, 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 and self-aggrandizing lifestyle. And Abinadi comes, and he just doesn't be around in the bush, just to the point, cuts to the chase, right? Woe be unto this people. I have seen their abominations, saith the Lord, their wickedness and their whoredoms, and except they repent, I will visit them in mine anger. He's bold. And that's verse, that's the about, end of verse 20, just so everyone knows yeah, where we're at. Yeah, the end of verse 20. He, he, Abinadi doesn't care about anything except delivering God's message. That's what he's about. He's not about himself, trying to protect himself. He just wants to do what the Lord wants him to do. And so I, I, I love that about Abinadi. Excellent. And if we notice that Abinadi delivers that message there in 20, 21, yeah. uh, up through then how do these people respond? We know what King Benjamin's people did to respond to the prophet, really chastising and, and bringing the people low uh, to the sense of their nothingness and worthlessness. But what's this? what are these people's response and why? It is, it is the opposite reaction. It is anger. It is, it is rage, you know, and, and it totally takes me back to, to, to first Nephi, where Nephi tells us that the, that the guilty take it the truth to be hard because it cutteth them to the very center. Right. I was talking to my kids about this the other night, Darren, actually, we were, as we were sitting and, and, and looking at, uh, at, at some of these chapters and, and, uh, um, I said, really guys, when, when, when the Lord gives us a prompting that we need to change something, we really only have two choices. Because we, when the prompting comes, we, we know it. We know it well enough that, that we can't deny it. So our choices are we're going to just cover it with emotion and with, with anger. And this is stupid. And how dare you tell me I need to change? And how dare you come and judge me? And, and we, 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 we throw up all these things to drown out those feelings from the Spirit. Or like King Benjamin's people, we humble ourselves. And, and, and accept it. And I was talking to my kids and just saying, you just have to decide, guys. When you feel cut by the Spirit, what do you want to be like? Do you want to be like these people and just rage against it and have to suffer for years after the fact? Or can you be humble enough to that's just a, listen? That's a great comment. So Ben and I is going to deliver a message. that They, they try to kill him, and, and the Lord doesn't let him. Not yet. No, uh, he doesn't. It, again, being a prophet might be cool, and sometimes this is not the time that I think it's it would not. be cool. Ben and I's no. outcome is not good, at least in this perspective of this life. But out of right. all the things that Ben and I shares, why don't you point us out what you feel is maybe the most uh, poignant or uh, pertinent to our, for us? I, honestly, the, of, of in all these chapters where he's talking, I think I think that the most the most poignant and where we need to really spend our time is where he really starts talking about the savior. Cause this is, this is, this is the crux of his message. It's, it's, it's everything he's building to as he starts, you know, his, his message about you need to repent or all this destruction is going to come. The, the language is harsh, but it's harsh because the Lord's trying to get the people's attention. God loves them enough that he, he, he want, he doesn't want them to suffer. He wants them to come unto Christ. And he's saying, listen, people, if, if you don't come unto, unto my son, if you don't come unto the Savior and, and let him change you, there's nothing left that I can do for you except to allow you to experience the afflictions that you're building. And so Ben and I in this conversation with the priest, right? King Noah, of course, is offended, you know, that, that, that Ben and I is calling him to repentance. And the priest, you know, say, well, let us, let, let us, let us ask him some questions. Let us talk to him, right? And let's see if we can cross him and, and get him to contradict himself. That what they're really trying to do is find some way by by the law of Moses to be able to condemn him is, is, what, is what they're trying to do, right? They want justification to put him to death. Which is a type uh, of Christ 
condemning yep. the savior oh. or the deliverer from by using his own law against him, which doesn't work. So continue on. Let's such go. A, such a great comment, Darren. I'm so glad you said that. Right. We should be seeing right the the the, the trial of Jesus Christ at night. Right. When, when, when they're talking to Abinadi, I, I think that's a great connection and stuff with this. Right. Well, Abinadi confounds them. Um, and, and so this is kind of funny right here to me because they just don't know what to say. They don't know what to ask because he's answering everything that they're saying. So they're like, well, what does this verse from Isaiah mean? Right. And if it's OK, Darren, I, I kind of want to read, read, read this verse 20, 21 uh, of, 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 of chapter 12. Now, they, they quote more of the Isaiah verses, but I'm just going to read those two verses, right? So, And it came to pass that that one of them said unto him, What meaneth the words which are written, which have been taught by our Father, saying, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, and bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. I mean, they're grasping, they're looking for anything to be able to condemn him. So like, well, let's just see what he says about Isaiah, which I think is kind of comical right here. But Abinadi, because he knows the word of the Lord and because he knows he, he knows what his message is, he uses this as his jumping point to get to Christ as fast as he can. He takes them a little bit through the law of Moses, illustrating it as a type of Christ, and, and that we keep the commandments of the law and we follow the law to look forward to him. And then he's just off into clear doctrinal teaching of the Savior. But he, he begins by quoting an entire chapter of Isaiah right here. And that's in chapter 13, excuse me, in chapter 14. He quotes Isaiah chapter 53, which to me becomes the heart of his, of his message right here. Oh, excellent. Which... Those for familiar, let's go to Mosiah chapter 14 and take a look at a few of these verses, because these are powerful verses about the Savior. Verse 30, uh, verse 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquities of us all. Please comment. Why, why are these verses do you feel Abinadi is sharing? I think he just really wants to help the people understand who Christ is. Okay? And what he will be like if they repent. Right? One of my favorite, favorite parts of this, um, or something I like to do in verse 4 and 5 in particular... Um, is every time the word our comes up, I, I just replace it with my. And I just do this in my mind when I read it, right? Surely he has borne my griefs and carried my sorrows. Yet I did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him, and with his stripes I am healed. You know, I... I, I <sighs> It's almost too because this chapter of Isaiah, as, as Isaiah begins it, I'm going to back up to verse 2 in just a minute, right? But, but Isaiah is, is, is really couching what Christ is like, but also how the people react to him, okay? Because, because the people that are mentioned in these verses don't, don't turn to him at first, right? Even though he, he does all this stuff for them. You know, as as it says in verse in verse in verse in verse four, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Right? They 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 hid, as it were, their faces from him. They 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 esteemed him not. In, in, in verse three, they missed him, even though he did all the stuff for them. Right? So, it, what what really strikes me in, in verse two is 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 the descriptions right here, um, as it talks about th this is this is the setting that Christ grows up in so i'm gonna go back and read verse two and just talk about this for a minute darren and then you you can you can please ask go ahead. questions or take a different direction after this but it's, it's, this is this is what he says for he being christ shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground it's interesting i, I spent some time recently when i read this looking up kind of the hebrew roots just on the app uh blue letter bible and and tender plant is 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 really just a a brand new plant, but but it's also something that's growing out of out of where a tree has been cut down, 
okay, or it's a sapling that has been taken from a decaying tree and replanted. And so you, you have this, this, this setting of, of, of apostasy, if you will. You know, there's dry ground. The, the, the tree in Israel is kind of just, just not doing well when Christ comes. And yet he comes and brings new life right here, right? He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should, dis, that we should desire him. You know, the, the, there's a Hebrew footnote actually in the Old Testament that, that says there was nothing about his appearance that, that just made us, made us desire him, you know? It, so he, he comes and, and he's bringing new life and he's, he's, he's one of them. He doesn't come with this, you know, this baby that's just glowing immediately, you know what I mean? But, but he just, he, he just, he just comes and he, you know, earlier you, you mentioned kind of King Benjamin, right? He describes him as being clothed in a tabernacle of, of clay, right? Just like you and I. And then he, he goes through and he suffers all these things for each and every one of us. And we have the decision. Are we going to turn away? Are we going to hide from him? Okay. Or, or are we going to repent and accept what he's done for us? And, things. and, I, and I just, I, just I, I think that Abinadi right here in chapter 14 is really trying to say, listen, he's, he's done this. Don't turn away. You have a chance right now to have him deliver you from what's coming if you will just repent. Excellent. I, I love that. And if you do repent, you accept him as as a father. Now in chapter 15, if we can just go to 15, just for a moment here, I don't want to spend much on 15 because the come follow me book talks about how Christ is both the father and the son. But I just want to recall that back in Mosiah chapter five, we learned that we're adopted and Christ becomes our father. Once we accept him and we take upon his name, just make that connection in there. Let's keep moving on a little bit here. Uh, chapter 16, much about the resurrection. In other words, the blessings of what the Savior uh, has done for us, the results, the, the final outcome, may I say, of, of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Anything in 16 that you uh, want to point out before we move on to Alma, who is the only one who seems to believe in Benedict? Yeah, yeah. If, 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 if it's okay, just for just a couple of things really quick. Verse 8 and 9. In, in, in particular, I, I, th I think are very important, right? Because all of, all of this is, is, is as Abinadi, you know, he's talked, he's talked about Christ's sufferings and things. He's moved to the resurrection. And it, it's really a message of deliverance, right? But he's, he's building toward, the, toward talking about judgment and, and telling them, guys, because of the resurrection, we're all going to stand before God, okay? And how we live determines what we receive, right from him but but I, I love his description of the resurrection in verse 8 okay where where he says but there is a resurrection therefore the grave hath no victory and the sting of death is swallowed up in christ right uh paul uses that language in the new testament right the the the, the pain the sharpness the the acute pain that 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 death can cause, you know for those who have who have, who have lost a loved one and things that can be swallowed up in christ because he is the light and the life of the world, yea, a light that is endless that can never be dark. Uh, that, that, that's a brilliant comment, right? I love One, that. Satan can never overcome him. Two, all the darkness that, that, that we experience in our lives, the difficulties and trials and things can never, if we choose, dim Christ for us, right? And, and, and I just, I, I think those are beautiful verses. Then he moves on talking about really the choice we have. Hey. You're going to be resurrected according to your works, right? You can have that which is good done unto you. Or if you want the resurrection of the damnation, that's your choice too. Please repent, as he's saying right here. So, Oh, I love that. That's great. Uh, let's move to chapter 17. That's our last chapter for this block here. You'll notice in verse 2 that Alma believes. And he actually stands up for Abinadi. But, no, or, but notice verse 2. King Noah gets mad. It's almost, I don't know if King Noah feels betrayed or whatever it might be, but he's mad and he says, go get Alma. And he's going to slay, last three words, might slay him. They're talking about Alma in those cases. So Absolutely. verse four, Alma takes off and he writes all that Abinadi said. Again, talk about another testimony of having a record. Write it down as soon as an experience happens to you. Because memory fades. 
Absolutely. Right. And, 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 and also the, just the gifts of the spirit that, that, that Alma must have had buried deep in there somewhere as he recalls all these chapters we've looked at of, of everything that Nephi has said. Mormon's quoting Alma and Alma's writings right here. That's right. Is, Otherwise we wouldn't know what's going on. Yeah, we, we absolutely wouldn't, you know, and, and it's an Abinadi. I don't, Abinadi, he doesn't really ever know about Alma and what happens. Right. You know, he, 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 you know, if he did see this, I don't know if this happened, I guess since, since, since Alma's defending him, maybe Abinadi did see, you know, Alma defending him, but maybe not. I don't know if Abinadi has been taken off scene for a minute or, or if this happens in front of him, but he doesn't ever know the outcome. And I, to, to me, and I don't mean to switch back to Abinadi for a minute, but I just think that's an important principle too, that, that, you, you know what, he was determined to be righteous regardless of what happened to him. He was going to fulfill what the Lord wanted him to. That is a great Anyways. principle. That's a discussion that we as parents could have with our kids. What yeah. if you were going to go to school and get beat up if you said you were a member of the church? Would you still go? I mean, are we willing to do what's right regardless? Now, Abinadi, it's interesting. If you go down to verse 7, they find an accusation that's worthy of death. And I've always thought, it, here's the legal sense. This is a court of law now. What is the final verdict? You know, same with the Savior, same with Joseph Smith. What was the final verdict that made them worthy of death? Verse 8 gives us the answer. I'm going to read 8. And tell me what really you think this is. Thou hast said that God himself shall come down among the children of men. That's it. That is the accusation. And now for this cause thou shalt be put to death. In other words, God will come down among the children of men is the only thing that they got on Abinadi that says that's worthy of death, which is ironic because the whole law of Moses, which they're supposedly living, is a prophecy and a foreshadowing that God himself will come down amongst us. Basically, he's accusing Abinadi of following the scriptures and putting them to death because of it. Yes, definitely. And, and, and not to talk about this in a sarcastic way, but he said, you know what, we're going to kill you because you said God's going to come down and help us. We don't want his help. Now, they're, 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 that's not what they're saying, but, but that's what Ben and I just taught them. He just taught them all that Christ would do for them, right? And it's like, you said he was, he was going to come and be a savior, so we're going to kill you. It, it's ridiculous, right? And, but it, it, it just shows what happens when you allow your heart to become hardened. Which is f interesting, because if you go to verse 11, yeah. Noah believes it, or at he least does. he's afraid of it. He, he is. He is. And, and Noah, again, you know what I mean? This is, this is great for kids, too. The danger of who we surround ourselves with. As he's about to release him, look, if it just, I mean, you, you, you look at verse 12, but the priest lifted up their voices against him and began to accuse him, saying, he's reviled the king. Noah, he talked bad about you. Well, I gotta look good in front of my friends. I can't. I can't back down now. And so he goes through with what he knows is absolutely wrong right here, right? And and it's interesting, you know. Just I, I love these verses, Darren. I'm sorry. I'm so excited about this, right? But you, you when when you go back to verse eight, like you were talking about too, there was one condition that would have got a Benedict off. They didn't even want him to recant what he said about God. If thou wilt recall all the words which thou hast spoken evil concerning me and my people. You just take back that you called me a bad guy. Take it back. Okay, that you said, uh, yeah, that, that, I, that I'm wicked, and I'll let you live. So really, uh, Noah is so consumed with his image that, that, that he's going to let him off the hook if he will just, don't tell the people I'm bad. Hey, they I'm, don't need to know. Appreciate you pointing that, that out, and that's great. And then here we have the final outcome of, of a righteous prophet in 13 and 14. He's being scourged and then burned. And yeah. during that moment, he prophesies of Noah's death, which has to be haunting, especially as we jump forward and Noah's in that experience of when he loses his life uh, by his own people's hands. He then he then has a testimony. He knows. He might remember that, you know, I felt something when Abinadi talked, but now I know Abinadi was a prophet. So right. here is maybe a good ending point is we can ask ourselves, have we ever felt the spirit when we've heard our prophets and apostles 
the wonderful men and women who lead this church, have we ever felt their teachings to be true? And then where did we choose? Did we choose to follow them? Or do we choose to keep our pride and surround ourselves with, I'm not a bad guy, I can do what I want. But someday we will know that our prophets and apostles uh, are following us with the uh, words of the Lord. Any final thoughts? You know, I just just kind of adding just just to what you just said. That's a great question, too, to ask ourselves if maybe we're having uh, any struggles with faith in any way with with modern day prophets. You know, it reminds me of Elder Anderson's talk from last conference, you know, that we need to record. And I'm, I'm using my own my own terminology, not quoting him because it's not in front of me, but but record the spiritually significant experiences that we've had. Right. You know, you, you talk about times that we've we've felt you know, that, that what prophets have said is true. I, I can remember those times very, very well. And if I ever question things, what a great thing to go back and look and say, w when did the spirit testify to me and recall that feeling, right? And, and, and man, if maybe if Noah would have done that, if he wouldn't have been focused so much on what other people were saying, but focused on what he was feeling, maybe he would have released him and maybe we have a different outcome. It's a great comment. So maybe a review of Elder Anderson's conference talk. Record those spiritual promptings. And are we having them and are we uh, remembering them? Well, thank you for visiting us today. And I hope everyone learned something from our Come Follow Me. And next week we will discuss Mosiah 18 through 24. And we'll see you all next week.